Let's turn to Judges chapter 11. Okay. I need to fix my clock. My clock says it's 825. So I have to adjust. I have to look at that clock and kind of adjust here in my brain, which is hard to do for a guy like me. Uh, if you need to borrow a Bible, if you raise your hand, I see David's got some that he's bringing around. Judges chapter 11. We are continuing on this morning with our study of what we have called the world's first superheroes. Um, and of course, it's, it's not that these people are necessarily uh, superheroes, but they, they were used by a very super God to do tremendously heroic things. Uh, the word judges means champions. And the, the cycle of the book of Judges, we've talked about this before, is that the, the children of Israel would, you know, be going through a, a time of peace, and then they would buy into the false worship of the gods of the people around them, and they would then come into bondage. Uh, and God would raise up an oppressor, and we've seen several, the Moabites, the Midianites, the Philistines, the Ammonites we'll talk about this morning. God raises up an oppressor, and then those oppressors put the people under tribute. Sometimes they make them do forced labor. Sometimes they would swarm in like locusts and consume all their produce. And then this would go on for a long time until finally the people would cry out to God, and then God raises up a deliverer. And we've seen some amazing folks so far, uh, so far Othniel, Deborah. We've seen Gideon, one of the more famous judges. This morning we come to Jephthah. Um, and the, the study this morning is... is somewhat jokingly entitled from loser to leader. And I know that sounds harsh, but when you see kind of where this guy starts, I mean, he comes from somewhat less than auspicious beginnings. But we could have called this from outcast to officer. We could have called it from cast off to commander. We see how God indeed uses this man that you would think comes from, you know, less than savory beginnings to go on to be one of these champions, one of these heroes. Um, and so for that, we're in chapter 11 this morning. Uh, we saw on Wednesday night two of what are considered to be minor judges. We've talked in the past about how the book of Judges presents major and minor judges. Some of the major judges would be Jephthah, Gideon, Samson, Deborah. Uh, and then you have the minor judges, Shamgar, Tola, Jair. We looked at Tola and Jair on Wednesday night. Didn't have a whole lot to say about them because there's not a whole lot written here. And the, the remainder of chapter 10, once again, highlights for us that vicious cycle and the fact that the people once again buy into the false gods and God raises up an oppressor and then they finally cry out for deliverance. Uh, so that's where we are as we come into chapter 11 this morning. Uh, let's pray before we dig in. Father, we love you. I pray that you would settle our hearts before you now, and I pray that you would speak to every single one of us. Uh, Lord, we love you so much, and there's so much to be gleaned here from this passage this morning. I pray that you would just give us by your spirit an unction, Lord God, just let us truly see with spiritually illuminated eyes and hear this morning your voice as we go through this passage. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. So towards the end of chapter 10, the people <clears throat> have assembled, but they don't have a leader. And so chapter 11 begins, now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, um, when we first saw Gideon introduced, the angel of the Lord appears to him and he says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And we saw when we looked at Gideon that when he first comes on the scene, he's very cynical, he's very bitter, somewhat resentful, saying, okay, if God's with us, why then are we being oppressed and all this kinds of stuff? So when we read this morning that Jephthah is a, is a mighty man of valor, uh, it kind of calls that introduction of Gideon to mind. Uh, and we read that he was the son of a harlot. He was the son of a prostitute. Uh, and that, so that's what I mean when I say he had somewhat less than savory beginnings. And we also read that Gilead begot Jephthah. So he's from Gilead. And it seems that his father is named Gilead. And that's entirely possible. There, there is another way you could read this is that he's from Gilead and Gilead, the area, is his father, that he's, he's, he's a man from Gilead. It would be like saying of me, Kevin is from Georgia, and he's a Georgia boy. 
It'd be like saying he's from Gilead and Gilead's his dad, meaning that it could have been any one of the men in the area of Gilead who was his father. That's one way you can take it, or it could simply mean that his father's name is Gilead. Gilead, you'll remember, first time it's mentioned is in Genesis chapter 31 when Jacob is fleeing from Laban's house, and I'm not necessarily going to rehearse that entire story for you, but if you, if you remember that account, both, both Laban and Jacob were real swindlers, man. I mean, they were hustlers. And when Jacob is fleeing from Laban and, uh, you know, one of his wives had stolen Laban's household idols and, you know, that we see her tricking her dad when he's looking for him and everything, the, the place where Laban finally catches up to him and where Laban and Jacob sort of enter into this, this pact, this agreement to leave one another alone is in the place called Gilead. That's the first place you see it mentioned in Scripture. Now, the other historical place that we read of Gilead is when the children of Israel are crossing over the Jordan to come into the Promised Land. There were two tribes and a half tribe, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, half the tribe of Manasseh, said, we just want to stay over here on the east side of the Jordan. We don't want to cross over the Jordan and come into the Promised Land. And you remember Moses was, was pretty upset by that. You know, he's like, shall, shall you sit here while your brothers go to war. And so they finally decide to go to war, but after they've taken the land, they're allowed to go back over into the land of Gilead. So that's kind of where the, the region of Gilead is. It's on the east side of the Jordan River. And we read here again that he is the son of a, of a prostitute. And Gilead's wife, verse 2, this is why it would seem to indicate that Gilead is indeed a person. Um, Gilead is Jephthah's father. His mother is a prostitute. But then Gilead has a wife, verse 2, and his wife has other sons. So she bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So we see this guy Jephthah, <clears throat> excuse me, right off the bat. I mean, he's, he's born from a prostitute. He's driven out by his brothers. His brothers basically say, nope, you're not going to hang out here. You're not going to have an inheritance in our house because you're born from some woman that we don't know. And we read in verse 3 that Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. Um, we don't know a lot about what's behind that statement that they went out raiding. Uh, probably this is very similar when we, when we read in 1 Samuel chapter 22, when, if you remember, when David is fleeing from Saul and he's hiding out in the caves, we read that 400 men, we read all who were in debt, all who were in distress, and all who were discontented, they're the ones who joined themselves to David. Um, you know, if you were, if you knew from God that you were going to be the king one day and you looked around at the army that God provided for you and your description as well. They're all in debt, they're all in distress, and they're all discontent. I mean, not, not a very flattering way of introducing, you know, David's army, but these guys go on to become the mighty men, you know, several of them. We read about tremendous things that they do. So when we read here about Jephthah fleeing to Tob and then these worthless men banding together with him and they go out raiding, it's probably very similar to that. And if you remember... There, there's definitely evidence that David and his mighty men, or David and that, that initial 400 guys, that they would essentially barter with towns by offering protection. Like they would help people, and then they would ask for food and things like that. So it's highly possible that this is a very similar start for Jephthah, that he's been driven out by his family. Now he's got this band of men around him. They're not very highly thought of, um, and they're going out raiding, and it's possible that they're raiding you know, the villages of the Ammonites, not necessarily raiding the people of God, but raiding the, the enemies of God. Verse 4 says, it came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And this will kind of, this is setting up the second half of our passage this morning. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war, verse 5, against Israel, that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they, lay, they said to Jephthah, come and be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So again, this guy starts as a cast off. He starts out as someone who's cast out by his own family. We don't want you around. You're not going to have an inheritance with us. His 
mother's a prostitute, but then when tough times come against the children of Israel, it's interesting that he's the one they go find. So during the time, kind of like when David's hiding out in the wilderness strongholds, God truly does work into David a lot of the characteristics that he would eventually then employ as a king over God's people. God makes this guy, Jephthah, into a tremendous leader. And I think, you know, that right there, there's a, there's a huge lesson for us. It, it, really, it really doesn't matter where we've come from. You know, it doesn't matter what our background is. And, and, and take note of this too. God does not hold against Jephthah any of the things that happened in Jephthah's life that he was not responsible for. There's no way that Jephthah could have controlled the circumstances that he was born through an illicit affair from a prostitute that his father slept with. He couldn't have controlled those circumstances, but God doesn't somehow impute that fault to him. But the enemy loves to do that number on our head. The enemy loves to come along and get us tripped up over our past and think, that's why God can't use me. Man, just go through some time and read the genealogy of Jesus himself. You know, there, you see a lot of real glaring marks, we might think, in the genealogy of Jesus. I mean, if we were going to arrange to present ourselves as a savior of the world, I dare say we would make our pedigree spotless. But the Lord chooses to be born through this line where you can look back, and I mean, you've got Rahab, and you know, you've got all these sort of dings in his record, we might say. Now, we're going to make some comparisons between Jephthah and Jesus in just a moment. But it's important, I think, for us to, to bear in mind, our past can't, it, it should not be a hindrance to what God wants to do in us and through us today. God is a restorer. He's a redeemer. He loves to take broken things and use them for his glory. And so it was when the people of Ammon, oh, sorry, uh, verse 6, they came to Jephthah and they said, be our commander so we can fight against the people of Ammon. Verse 7, so Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come now when you're in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead, verse 9, so Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said in verse 10, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your word. So Jephthah just is very direct and he asks the question, why do you want me to come and do this? You know, am I not the guy that you expelled? Am I not the guy that you cast out? Why are you, why are you turning to me? And they're like, well, I'll tell you what, if you come back and fight for us and lead us, you'll, you'll be our head. And, and he asks very directly, really? Is that what's really going to happen? Am I really going to be your head? And I mean, you think about this from Jephthah's perspective. I mean, he's probably projecting ahead. And he's thinking, look, I don't want to go through this again. I don't want to come back you know, lead you in a victory only to have you then turn around and cast me out all over again. And like I said, I want to make some comparisons here between Jephthah and Jesus. When you think about Jesus and Jephthah, you know, Jephthah is born to a prostitute. Jesus Christ had the stigma that followed him his whole life, that he was born out of fornication. He was born out of wedlock. You know, when you look at one of the reasons why the Pharisees did not accept Jesus, he as an adult, as a 30-year-old man, they said to him, well, we were not born of fornication. 30 years after the fact, the stigma has still followed Jesus that his, his mother was pregnant before she was married. Now, we would certainly never go so far as to say it's the same circumstance, right? I mean, Jephthah is truly born from a prostitute. But through the, uh, the world of the eyes, Mary was pregnant before she was married. And they, they contextualized that as your mom committed fornication. You know, Joseph really wrestled with, do I, do I take Mary and, you know, have something done to her, potentially have her stoned? 
So that stigma followed Jesus. The other, the other thing about Jephthah and Jesus is that Jephthah is cast out by his brothers, and Jesus is rejected by his brothers. He's rejected by the Jewish people. And then Jephthah goes and becomes the hero of the outcasts. What did Jesus do? When he's rejected by the Jews, he comes and he becomes the savior of the Gentiles, who at that point in time were considered the off-scouring of society. But then, in the same way that Jephthah's brothers turn to him once again, we know that a day is coming when the Jews will indeed look upon him whom they've pierced, and they will call him their savior. They will turn to him once again. And in the same way that Jephthah says to the people today, am I only going to be your head because you're in need? But when that's all over, you're not going to have anything to do with me again? I think Jesus would ask the same question of us this morning. I don't believe that Jesus just wants to be our Lord while we are in distress. He wants to be our Lord all the time. He wants to be our Savior all the time. So there's a lot of similarities in this Jephthah and story and, and Jesus, I remember years ago, a good friend of mine, Gary Lawton, teaching this passage. At his, he was an assistant pastor at the time, and, and he did a, did a study called The Outlaw Savior, and it was about Jephthah. And I've never forgotten sort of the similarities between Jephthah and Jesus. So he asks this question. Okay, if you take me back, verse 9, and I fight against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivers them, Shall I be your head? And the elders, verse 10, say to him, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. And Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Mizpah means watch. And let me hearken back to something I shared at the beginning of the study where you first see Mizpah in the scriptures is in that account of Jacob and Laban, when Jacob has fled from Laban. And again, if you remember the story, you know, Jacob, he meets Rachel, and he goes and he makes an agreement with Laban that he's going to work for seven years for his daughter. And Laban's like, sure. And he works for seven years. And then on the wedding night, Laban dupes Jacob, and he delivers to him Leah. And Jacob wakes up in the morning. He's like, what? you know, and then Jacob or Laban's like, no, you got to work another seven years for Rachel. So he forces him to work another seven years. And then Jacob ends up with two wives. And then Jacob says, well, you know, give me some of your flock. And he says, well, you need to work a little bit for me. You know, I mean, just Laban's this, this swindler. But when you look at who Jacob is, I mean, Jacob's the same way. So he's kind of met his match in Laban. And he's finally got his two wives, and he's got the flock, and he, and he leaves, and he's fleeing from Jacob, uh, Laban, and Laban comes after him. He catches up to him, and he's like, what are you, why are you doing this? Why are you taking my daughters? Why are you taking my flock? And Jacob's like, what are you talking about? I worked for all this stuff for you, and you kept making me work all over again, and you kept changing my wages. And they finally strike this agreement. They say, I'll tell you what. We're going to set up a little mound here, and you stay on that side of it, and I'll stay on this side of it. We won't bother each other again. And they call that heap of stones Mizpah. And they say, the Lord will watch between you and me. And it's interesting to me that Jephthah goes, and he strikes this bargain with the people of Gilead at the same place. It's like, okay, I'm going to hold you to your word. The Lord's going to watch between you and me to make sure that this whole idea of me being your head after the victory is given to us, that that's going to stand. That's where they make that agreement. Now, verse 12, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon saying, what do you have against me that you have come to fight against me in my land? Now, I think this is very wise. You see Jephthah at the onset being very diplomatic in his approach. He, he just asks a simple question. Maybe the whole thing can be resolved by striking an accord. Why are you here? Why are you in my land? Why are you here fighting against my people? Verse 13, And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok, and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands peaceably. Now, I want you to watch what Jephthah does here. 
Because this to me becomes highly relevant in the day and age in which we live. Okay? Jephthah says, why are you here? Why are you in our land? And the king of Ammon says, well, it's, it's not your land. It's my land. So watch what happens. Verse 14, Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab nor the land of the people of Ammon. Because when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not heed. And in like manner, they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh and they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab came to the east side of the land of Moab and encamped on the other side of the Arnon, but they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to, to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land into our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory, so Sihon gathered all his people together, encamped in Jahaz, and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? Okay, so... He comes up, the Amorites, or the Ammonites, I should say, two names that are very similar right next to each other in the Bible, again. So the Ammonites have come, and they're fighting against the Israelites, and they, the men of Gilead come, and they find Jephthah, and they say, come be our leader, fight against them for us. So Jephthah sends word, and he says, why are you here? Why, why are the Ammonites in our territory? And the king of the Ammonites says, well, it's not your territory, it's our territory. And Jephthah says, uh, no, actually, here's what happened. When the children of Israel were coming up out of Egypt, we weren't going to go through your territory. In fact, we sent word to the king of Moab and to the, the, the other king, the king of uh, Edom, and we weren't going to go through your land. We were going to go around it. In fact, we did go around it, and we never even entered the territory. But then King Sihon, king of the Amorites, check this out, who, by the way, had defeated the Ammonites previously. Okay, this is, this is where this becomes important. The king of Ammon is saying, this is our land. Jephthah says, he gives him a history lesson. He says, no, that's not accurate. Your people were defeated by the Amorites, King Sihon and the Amorites. And when the children of Israel were coming through, we weren't going to make war with them, but the king of the Amorites fought against us and we beat him. And so the land became ours. Why is this important? Because there's people nowadays trying to change history. Okay, this is huge to me because if you don't know your history and if you don't know, I'm talking about your biblical history. See, our political view needs to be informed from what the Bible teaches, not to have your view of the Bible be based on your political preferences. And I watch this happen all the time. There's I suppose, well-meaning believers out there lobbying for why the Jews should let up and let the Palestinians have the land. The reality is it's not theirs. It's the Jews. God gave it to them. And our Bible clearly teaches that. But people want to come along and say, no, no, here's what really went down. No, you and me as believers, we need to know biblical history so that we can do what Jephthah did and reason with people and say, now, wait a second, that's not what history teaches. When people come along and say, we want to change textbooks and take the Holocaust out because it's offensive. Is it not offensive to the Jewish people to take it out of the history books? See, we, we need to know our history because there's a tremendous movement on to change history for the same reason that the Ammonites, their thinking on history only went back to a certain point. And Jephthah said, no, let's go all the way back further than that. You're right. The land had been yours, but then you guys got your 
bum kicked by the Amorites, and we weren't going to bother him. And then when we came through and we're keeping to ourselves, he fought against us and we beat him. So it's ours. That's history. That's what really went down. And it's, it's so cool to watch this go on. This to me becomes so insightful for why it's so important for you and I to know the word of God. Because Jephthah, yes, we can say that he knows his history, but ultimately he knows the word of God. He knows what's written in the Bible and he uses it to reason for why he's doing what he's doing. He's using it to reason for why his worldview is the way it is. And we have to be careful not to let what we think is more politically correct or whatever and, and, and sort of have that and, and take our preference and go back here and say, well, I don't know if I really believe that. It doesn't matter because this is true. This actually happened. This is an historical document. More support in the, the, for the Bible than any other ancient historical document. As a matter of fact, you, people won't say that, but if you go do the research, you find that to be true. There's more historical evidence in support of the Bible than Caesar's Gaelic Wars, Aristotle, Plato. I mean, there's, it just blows them all away, the amount of copies that we have for the Bible. So it's just interesting to me. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me is verse 24. Here's the spin that Jephthah puts on it. He rightly sees this conflict for what it is, which is ultimately a spiritual conflict. Okay, so he says in verse 23, will you not possess whatever Chemosh your God gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God takes possession of before us, we will possess. He says, look, if you want the land, let your God give it to you. Let Chemosh give it to you. Chemosh was not technically an Ammonite god. He was a god of the Moabites, I believe, but it's possible that the Ammonite god Milcom was the same, was their version of Chemosh. But my, my point is simply this, that Jephthah rightly makes the link that what ultimately is going on here is a spiritual war. Okay, and we can look at the political scene, we can look at the Middle East, and we can look at the conflict there that's been going on and how there's tried to be all these different resolutions. And we can only process it through a political lens, but we have to realize that ultimately it's a spiritual conflict. It's a spiritual conflict. And that's how Jephthah processes this. This isn't just about land. This isn't just about you know, you wanting it and us wanting it and you thinking it's yours and us thinking it's ours. Tell you what, if it's yours, you let your God give it to you. If it's ours, we'll take what our God gives us. And of course, they're victorious. And we know that ultimately it's going to be the Jewish people who are going to be victorious. God himself is going to step in and miraculously defend the Jewish people when that band of Asiatic countries come against them, possibly in some kind of nuclear exchange. We read about it in the Gog Magog prophecy of the book of Ezekiel. God will never again allow his people, the Jewish people, to be dispersed from the land. It's theirs. God gave it to them. He's going to miraculously defend them. And I believe that when he does, it will be at that moment that they look upon him whom they've pierced and they realize that Jesus is indeed the Savior. And God's going to bring that to pass. In the same way that Jephthah can say, tell you what, our, if our God gives it to us, then it's ours. That's exactly what's going to happen in the Middle East. The land belongs to the Jews. Now the Antichrist is going to come along and he's going to dupe a lot of people and He's going to walk into the rebuilt Jewish temple and there declare himself to be God, commit the abomination of desolation, and force the world into worship of himself. And for a time, for a time, he will indeed be given authority over the saints. But ultimately, the Lord is going to come back and defeat him with the breath of his nostrils. Just blow him away, literally, right? Cast him into the lake of fire. He says, I'll tell you what, verse 24, you possess what Chemosh your God gives to you, we'll take what our God gives to us. 
And now, verse 25, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? Um, that is another historical reference. You, you remember that, remember the account of Balaam and his donkey? Balaam was, was called a prophet. It's an inter interesting account, and he's hired by Balak, the king of Moab, to pronounce a curse upon the children of Israel. And you have the whole account of Balaam. Once again, two biblical names very similar right next to each other. It's like God does that on purpose to trip up Bible teachers. You know, Elijah and Elisha, Amorite, Ammonite, Balak, Balaam, they're all just right there. Um, so Balaam's on his way to curse the children of Israel, and that's when there's the whole account of the talking donkey. The donkey, you know, God opens his mouth, and he tells him not to do it, and Balaam's just whipping the donkey. You know, it's crazy to me. I read that account, and I think, so the, the dude is so stubborn that there's a donkey talking to him, and he doesn't realize something supernatural is taking place because he's bound and determined. He right? just overlooks the fact that a donkey is speaking. You know, and the donkey has more spiritual insight than him. The donkey sees there, in, there is an angel standing in the way, and the donkey keeps turning and like sits down and like sits on ba Balaam, and he's like, ah, and he gets up and he's beating the donkey. Anyway, it's a great story. Um, but, but here, Jephthah says, you know, look, think about Balak. Balak tried to have Balaam curse the people. And every time Balaam would go up on the mountain and like go to speak a curse, he would open his mouth and what would come out is a blessing. God would literally not let Balaam pronounce a curse upon the people. I have literally prayed that prayer before in my life. I'm like, Lord, you know, don't let this person say anything against me. I remember when, I don't know what the occasion was, but I was very young in ministry and had done something, I'm sure, quite boneheaded. I don't remember what the exact circumstances were, but I remember my senior pastor, my boss, you know, he's like, I need to talk to you, you know, kind of the way you guys react when I send you a text. I'm like, I need to talk to you, you know. I don't know why we have that principal's office mentality, you know. I'm like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? People are like, uh, Yeah. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. I just want to talk to you for a minute. And I remember like being called into my pastor's office and on, on the way to his office, I, I was like, Lord, don't let him pronounce a curse upon me. Like, Lord, if he goes to pronounce a curse upon me, let a blessing come out instead. And I remember like I got a raise or something. I mean, it was crazy. I had done something really dumb and it ended up becoming a blessing. And I'm like, yes, this is great. So anyway, be Jephthah shares this story. He's like, look, remember Balak. He's not, he wasn't allowed to fight against God's people. You're not going to be any more victorious than he is. Verse 26, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and its villages, in Aror and its villages, and in all the cities along the banks of the Arnon, check this out, for 300 years, why did you not recover the land during that time? Why have you been sitting around for 300 years, twiddling your thumbs, leaving us alone, and now, all of a sudden, you want to come in and possess the land? It's a legit question. Therefore, he says, verse 27, I have not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words with which Jephthah sent him. And I'll say this right now. You know, we, we have an enemy. It, there's a spiritual war going on right now. Same way that Jephthah contextualizes this. You know, he squares Chemosh against the God of Israel. Sometimes the way that that spiritual battle manifests itself is through political agenda. And, and listen, we know that our enemy, Satan, can indeed influence political leaders. We, we look into the book of Revelation, for instance, and we see how there will be these demons that are going to be released that will go out and influence the kings of the earth. We look at the Antichrist and how that political leader will be bodily possessed by Satan himself to, to you know, bring persecution against the Jews and against the Christians. So there's a spiritual battle, but it does manifest itself in these political things, these agendas. I mean, you know that. 
You look at what's happening in the world around us, and you know me, I, I rarely talk about politics. The only reason I'm talking about it this morning is because it's, it's right here in the Bible. This is so timely in my mind. But, but here's the thing, and we need to see what happens with Jephthah. I mean, Jephthah is so well-versed in his history. He's so well-versed in the Word of God, and he presents, I mean, just a very well-thought-out argument for why the land does not belong to the Ammonites. It belongs to God's people. But the king of Ammon's not having any of it. And here's the thing. We have an enemy who will not be reasoned with. He is very committed to his cause. He's not going to listen to reason or biblical arguments, but that doesn't mean you and I should not be able to weave those biblical arguments. It does not mean that you and I, as those enlisted into the Lord's army, engaged in this spiritual war that's raging all around us, it does not mean that you and I should not be able to reason from the Scriptures. Even though we know those reasons may not be heeded, it may not be listened to, we should still be a voice. We should still be a messenger. We should still be salt, light, letting our light shine, bringing that preserving agent to planet Earth, staying the corruption, bringing healing and flavor, because there is a way in which, and Scripture indicates this, Jesus himself says this, he says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it then be seasoned? It's then good for nothing. See, see, we don't want to be salt that loses our saltiness because then we're really not that useful. And I think that one of the most used tactics of our enemy, and, and Scripture says we're not ignorant of his devices. The, the enemy has no power over you and I. We have been Delivered, and Colossians tells us that on the cross, he was disarmed. You know, you know what it is to disarm someone. And if a police officer stops a criminal, stops a villain, and they take away their weapon, they have been disarmed. No matter how that criminal may talk about having another weapon, they don't. And Scripture says of Satan, he's been disarmed. He has no power over you and me. But what he loves to do is act like he does. And what he loves to do is threaten and intimidate and use fear tactics to just get us to shut up and just keep us quiet about spreading the news of Jesus. Why? Because it's news of Jesus that has the power to save people's souls. And if he can't take you and me down, at least what he can do is get us quiet. He can try to slap us with a gag order. Friends, don't be intimidated by Satan. The book of Isaiah seems to indicate that when we finally see Satan, we're going to say, him? Him? Is is he the guy that troubled the whole earth? It's going to be like the... The scene from the Wizard of Oz, you know, where they come in and there's that big floating head. And when the curtain finally gets pulled over, you got that little bald guy, you know, the man behind the curtain. He's got like, no power at all. He's a complete sham. That's Satan, man. He has no real power. He can only do what God allows him. He has to get God's permission. He's been disarmed. You've been delivered. Greater is he who is in you than he who was in this world. Amen. And you have the word of God. You have what we're talking about this morning on your mobile device, on your iPad, your phone, or open on your lap in front of you. Steep yourself in this so that we are equipped, well-versed, able to go out and defend the truth. Because if the enemy just shuts us up, who's going to be out there spreading the truth? Who's going to be the ones out there saying, actually, that isn't what's happened? Actually, let me tell you what history, what really happened in history. Let me tell you what really went down. 
I sit there and I put my kids to bed at night and I think, wow. You know, I mean, these, these kids, are, they're just going to be attacked. You know, the enemy's going to stop at nothing to just slowly subvert the, the, the truth of God's word. We were driving to church this morning because I'm, I'm in single dad mode right now. Amanda and uh, Mandy Gale and Eamon are over in Africa with the Tanzania team. And I don't know if you've seen it, but you should go to our Facebook page and look at that video of Eamon that uh, Jenny took and sent us. He's like, he's like, he, he can't. I wanted to show it this morning because I thought some people do this while I'm teaching. You know, he's like, <laughs> he can barely keep his head up. And um, so I'm in single dad mode. I got Eamon and Avin, you know, I got my five-year-old, and my three-year-old and we're driving to church this morning and like Eamon's right behind me and he's singing this song. He's like, I love me. I love me. And I looked at him and I'm like, Eamon, what, or Avin, what are you singing? He goes, I love me. I'm thinking, you little sinner. <laughs> you little selfish sinner. He says, I love me. That's me sometimes, man. I love me. See, that's our nature, but, but God's put a new nature into us, a nature and, and a spirit of, of truth. But the enemy will stop at nothing to, to corrupt that. Keep yourselves from idols. Bad company corrupt good's character. Gird up the loins of your mind. Put on the spiritual armor. Abide in my word. You'll know the truth. We're told over and over again things that we do to prepare ourselves for this spiritual conflict. To be emissaries for truth and grace and the saving power and message of Jesus Christ in this world. Don't let the enemy intimidate you into being that. Amen? Come back Wednesday night. We're going to look at Jephthah's victory and vow as we continue the story of the world's first superheroes. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you, you change, you continue to work in us and change our nature from being people who say, I love me to I love you. And I'm passionate about you. And Lord, you've made us passionate about others. And you've made us passionate about your work and the church you're building and the message you've given us of the gospel. God, just continue to work into us who you are. Lord, help us to understand that if, if we're just filled with your spirit and, and, and steep ourselves in your word, that your truth will just will become so saturated by it. That it will just, it'll come forth out of us. That's what you said. If we'll drink of what you put into us, it will gush forth from our lives. Help us to realize it's less about trying to be the right Christian. And it's just about surrendering and allowing your power to come upon us and work through us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the time we've had together to worship to sit at your feet, to be equipped, I pray, fill every single one of us this day with a fresh filling of your spirit that we might go out of these doors today. And as the sign over our door said, go on to the mission field with the radical message of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.